presents Start Our Sabbath, SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host, for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. I am working my head off. Yeah, you are working <laughs> something off I didn't here. get I didn't get everywhere I needed to be. Okay, but I think we got the show going. We think we've had so much technological problems. All right, good evening and welcome to our 70th show of Start Our Sabbath. We're glad you decided to spend time with us tonight. We're glad we sp decided to spend time we're, with us tonight. We're <laughs> delighted we can even be here tonight. It's always such a pleasure to be with you every Friday evening. Uh, we always look forward to the electronic assembly at, at the beginning of every Sabbath. And we greatly appreciate the love that you show to us and to, uh, each other in the chat room every Friday evening. And that's just one of the reasons we say it's our privilege to serve you. The purpose of the show is to help you have a good Sabbath. And you know, you make this production so much easier because you make it enjoyable. So thank you again for your participation. And we're the show that likes to talk about how God is a family. That's right. Like... We have our Father who's in heaven. We have our elder brother, Jesus Christ, who intervenes for us on a, on a daily basis. And in this family relationship that we're describing, always remember that God has no grandchildren. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, as, God, as a child of God, you don't have to go through some other man to reach our eternal Father. During Jesus' crucifixion, the veil of the temple was ripped. And this ripping of the temple veil now allows us to have direct access to God. With no human priest, no go-between. There's no longer a human intermediary who communicates between us and God. Each of us has direct access to our Heavenly Father. God has no grandchildren. Now, that's absolutely true and wonderful. Uh, pizza, <laughs> speaking of pizza, uh, now Wes has had his pizza, and he's all happy tonight. Yes, I am. And, and you know, I have a question about pizza. Uh, well, what kind of question? Well, pizza is round, but then they put it into a square box... And then when we eat it, it's in little triangles. Have you ever wondered about that? No, I confess that's not ever crossed my mind. Well, I was asked that question by uh, my good friend Joe. Joe who? You know, Joe and Alice, they live in Topeka, Kansas. Joe and Alice don't live in Topeka, Kansas. They, they live in Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, then who lives in Kansas? I don't know, Dorothy and Toto? <laughs> okay. <laughs> As always, we have just got to give a, a big thank you to our technical folks tonight. Absolutely, because without our great technical people, we'd never be able to broadcast this show. We want to give a big shout out to Carl Nocktreeb and his assistant Mimi, who's, uh, who connect our Facebook feed to the YouTube feed every Friday evening. And please remember that Carl is also the webmaster of two websites, Dynamic Christian Ministries and the Ronald L. Dart Association. That's right, and we also want to give a shout out to the long-suffering wife of Bill Lucenhide. Long-suffering? Yes, we want to thank Terry for her great work that she's doing out there in California, and if she's married to Bill, she's long-suffering. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Can't argue we, with that. <laughs> we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, Nancy is going to talk about sloppy agape. Bill is going to talk about occupy till I come. And then I'm going to talk about, of all things, tattoos and the 613 laws of the Torah. We think you're going to enjoy all three presentations tonight. Let's open with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you that um, you have helped us put on this show. We thank you for the inspiration you gave uh, to us in writing the show and also for the help you've given us on the technical aspect of it. Father, we ask for your blessing on this show. We ask for your love to be here with all of us among all your people, your obedient ones who are keeping your seventh day Sabbath and who are very grateful for the knowledge of this great blessing, this great gift called the Sabbath. Now, please be with us on this show. Please guide and direct everything we do and say. We give you praise and thanks for all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, coming up next, we have uh, lessons of uh, about rock and roll. Uh, uh, but uh, And Nancy's going to talk about sloppy agape. But first, we're going to take this short commercial break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back as soon as I can make this work. Okay. Isn't life all about making one hard decision after another? And sometimes a solution to a problem causes a whole new set of problems down the road. What would it be worth to you to know God's will as you go through this life making difficult decisions? Back in 1995, Ronald Eldar gave a message entitled, Four Principles of God's Will, where he showed you can determine what God's will really is. You can find this message and many more on the website of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. Our website is rldea.com. Our website has many informative and interesting messages by the late Ron Dart, who was one of the most effective evangelists of the 20th century Sabbath-keeping movement. Again, the title is Four Principles of God's Will at rldea.com. We're back. Now, before we get into our three segments, I'd like to talk about uh, rock and roll uh, just a little bit. And, and I know Nancy's sitting there horrified now. She's saying, oh, no, do you really think it's appropriate for us to be talking about rock and roll? And if Christian I had said? been here, I would have said it. That's right. And, I'm back now. <laughs> and and it's, not, it's not like I'm going to be advocating sex and drugs or anything well, like that. Well, please be careful as you handle this topic. Okay, I promise to be careful. Now, most of you out there know that I'm an old rock and roller from, from the 60s. In fact, oh, wait, here, let, let, let's do this. Let's do, let me take off my boot here. Ah, here we go. Looky here. I still wear beetle boots after all these years, okay? Wow, you really are an old rock and roller. That's right. Now, I haven't been in the rock and roll business for a long, long time, but I do distinctly remember certain aspects of the rock and roll culture. Be careful there. I will, I will. First... The average lifespan of every rock and roll band is about six months. Now, sure, some bands like the Rolling Stones have been around for 50 years, but that's a real exception. Any band that gets created is probably going to last, on average, only about six months. Some rock and roll bands only last a couple of days. All right, that's first principle. Second, every band that exists is only one argument away from breaking up. And it doesn't take much to bust up a band. That's how fragile they are. All they've got to do is get into a fight over a song or a gig or a girl, and it's all over. That band is gone. Bands are fragile. Third, rock and roll bands are not the epitome of Christian love. It's kind of an understatement. One of the hardest things for guys in a rock and roll band to do is to suborn personal interest into that of the good of the whole group. Fourth, once a band breaks up, many, many times the ex-band members are not ever going to be friends again. And this is so sad because when the band first starts, it's usually a bunch of guys who really like each other. They love hanging out with each other. And when they first get together, they start creating uh, music and they're like this, wow, that sounded so cool. Did we do that? Initially, they're totally infatuated with their artistry and with each other. But sooner or later, the thrill is going to wear off. Let me guess, you're always applying your observations to how we in the church should live our lives. So, are you going to suggest that some churches act a lot like rock and roll bands? That's exactly what I'm saying. Now, before you get offended and turn off the show, please hear me out. Don Henley of the Eagles pointed out that the Eagles broke up in the 70s because band members weren't mature enough 
to sit down and work out their differences. Instead, mm -hmm. when there was a disagreement, they'd get mad at each other, they'd scream and, and yell at each other. They had no ability to effectively implement conflict resolution. Now, does that sound familiar? I've been griping for years that too many Sabbath-keeping churches are totally incapable of sitting down and talking things out. Too many churches are only one fight away from a split. Too many churches have members who are incapable of suborning their personal interests into the good of the whole. And too many church members get estranged to the point where they're never going to be friends again. And this is so wrong because this whole picture that I've just painted demonstrates such a lack of love. Now, let's be clear. For the most part, I doubt the church people have actual hate in their hearts. Now, I, I really don't see hate in all the splits that I've witnessed, witnessed. Usually not. Once in a while, but mostly not. But here's the problem. They have neither hate nor love. Neither one. And any existence that's neither hot nor cold, has neither hate nor love, is neither fish nor fowl, such an existence can only be described as a walking purgatory where the person is neither alive nor dead. How can one who claims to be a Christian read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and not recognize that a lack of love for others during their walk with Christ creates a huge hole? I mean a purgatorial abyss. Rock and rollers are usually a bunch of immature, licentious young punks who can't figure this conflict resolution thing out. And we expect this from them. It doesn't surprise us that they, that they lack love. But we don't expect this deficiency from church members who are supposed to be mature adults, Christians who are supposed to be oozing with brotherly love. Again, where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? Over the past few weeks, I've once again witnessed a few more examples of people who are still holding on to grudges from past hurts and past gripes in the church. And I'm trying to figure out if I'm more amazed than appalled or if I'm more appalled than amazed. And I constantly ask myself, what's it gonna take for us to lay our weapons down? The Jews have an expression, tikkun olam, and it means repair the world. And when I first learned this Orthodox Judaism expression as a young man, it took, I took it to mean that the Jews recognize that the Old Testament prophets tell how the Messiah is someday going to come and repair the damage to the physical earth upon his arrival. And, and this is indeed part of the phrase. But more recently, I've discovered that the Jews also look at Tikkun Olam as an admonition to do what we can in this age to help repair the world. The churches of God need to immediately start practicing Tikkun Olam Repair, the repairing of ourselves in this age. And, and we've got to fix ourselves before we get too enamored with planning for the repairs that we're going to do in the, to the world in the next age. we got to practice Tikkun Olam now, today. When we practice Tikkun Olam in this age, what we're doing is this. We're overcoming sin. We're growing in grace and knowledge. In other words, we're maturing. Yeah, we need to get our house in order today so that Jesus can, move, can, can more effectively utilize us in the future when the time comes for us to repair the world during the kingdom of God. And it's my prayer that most of you out there have not experienced this type of church dysfunctionality that we sometimes talk about in this show. It's my prayer that you haven't in the past and that you never will. It's my prayer that you're presently fellowshipping with a group that has a lot of Christian love. I say this because I've observed that once a Christian goes down that path of anger, revenge, and animosity towards others, it's so hard to repudiate and get rid of that negativity. And sometimes I wonder if these people will ever be able to shake off their negativity. And the words of the rock and roller Don Henley seem to aptly describe this anger, imprisoned mindset that's in too many Christians. He wrote, he said, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. So if you're a young person listening to the show tonight, learn conflict resolution early in life. 
Learning conflict resolution is like learning a foreign language or a musical instrument. The earlier you start learning it in life, the easier it's going to be to become proficient in. Conversely, the later in life that you try to learn it, the more difficult it's going to be. Conflict resolution, Tikkun Olam, we all need it. A little rock and roll wisdom for you tonight. Yeah. Now, we realize that when we take, you, you realize that when we take, I hope, that when we take on difficult topics like this, we're going to get emails and text messages that are say, why does SOS take on such controversial mm -hmm. subjects? Why, do you have, why don't you just give us smooth words? Well, I realize we're going to get inquiries like this. Let me answer that question right now before they start coming okay. in. Why do we take on the controversial topics? Because good preaching and good teaching require courage. If a minister doesn't demonstrate courage in his preaching and teaching, his messages are just advertising. If a minister's messages are just a bunch of safe topics that are perfectly in line with his group's messages, all he's doing is advertising his group's product. If we're going to preach and teach, let's demonstrate a little bit of courage and be willing to take on all the tough issues. All right, we've got Bill Lucenhide standing by, but first, uh, what have you got for us tonight, sweetheart? I got some sloppy agape. <laughs> All right, let's talk about sloppy agape. We've, uh, we've talked about this subject on the show before, and let's begin by seeing if we can define exactly what is this sloppy agape. According to the Dictionary of Christianese, yes, that is actually a thing, Sloppy agape is used in three ways. First, as lavish but merely verbal or superficial affirmations of love and care for someone. Affirmations that are not backed up by concrete action or long-term support. Two, a permissive relationship or environment in which people are not held accountable for the consequences of their mistakes. And, and any teachings that emphasizes, emphasizes God's uh, forgiveness over and above the need for believers to be holy and obedient. The term sloppy agape sometimes is thought to be the opposite of tough love. And three, weeping and blubbering experience during intense worship or prayer, sometimes associated with extreme emotional vulnerability or spiritual ecstasy. The metaphor is that a person's tears, drool, and snot are messy or sloppy evidence of the person's direct experience of God's agape love. So for the purposes of tonight's discuss discussion, I'd like to use part of the second definition, uh, which is this. Any teaching that emphasizes God's forgiveness over and above the need for believers to be holy and obedient. I believe this is what Christians in most Sabbath-keeping culture think about uh, often, most often when they hear the term sloppy agape. I believe this is what they mean when they use the phrase. And tonight I want to encourage us, all of us, to understand just how sloppy is the agape we receive from our Father and our Savior. In other words, I want to preach some sloppy agape. Let's begin with Romans 5, 6 through 8, where it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Did you catch that? Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, Messiah, perfect land, di lamb, died for you. He died for me. He died for every president of the United States of America. He died for every third world, world dictator, for every despot throughout the world while they were in their sins, before they even knew him or cared about him or followed him. And if we love God back now, it's only because he loved us first. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he loved us first. He first loved us. Those who turn up their noses at the idea of God's love being given without requirement may quote scriptures like John 3, 16 through 17, where it says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now note that this says that we must believe in him to be saved. And the word saved is not the same word as the word loved. This past Sunday, Wes and I finally got to watch the movie Won't You Be My Neighbor. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jeff Reed was on the show and he talked about this movie. This film is about the TV ministry of the late Mr. Rogers. 
Incredibly, some folks want to pin the fault of an entire generation of what they call entitled young people on Mr. Rogers and his emphasis on encouraging, encouraging children to understand that they are worthy of love just the way they are. Rogers, in fact, never encouraged children to stay the same. No, he encouraged them to change. He encouraged children to make smart choices, like not trying to jump off buildings like Superman did. Rogers encouraged children to love everyone by inviting a black policeman to share his foot bath in his kiddie pool and even sharing Rogers' own towel to dry the uh, black policeman's feet. Rogers didn't like children's programs that showed people getting hit in the face with a pie or getting slime dumped on them or getting knocked to the ground. He felt these things taught children that this type of behavior was acceptable and even funny. So it isn't that Mr. Rogers never asked children to be better people and better citizens and better neighbors. He just never linked those choices to being loved. You know, God is not lesser than Fred Rogers. He has plenty to say about how to be a better neighbor. We read so much about that in Matthew 25. So while God clearly tells us to be better, to overcome sin, to love one another, he still loves us even in our sin. There's no linkage between God's love and our behavior. The term tough love, by the way, is not in the Bible. I'm not sure we can say that God practices thing, this thing called tough love even. And you may disagree by saying God demonstrated tough love uh, toward Israel during his punishment of them. But when you try to make this point, please keep the following in mind. God always showed more mercy to his sinful nation than he did punishment. Let me give you a quick example. In the book of Judges, we constantly see Israel going through the cycle of sin, punishment, repentance, forgiveness, over and over. <clears throat> they were a sinful people. The book of Judges alone, in this book we find that the Israelites sinned exceedingly, those words, sinned exceedingly, no less than seven times. And that's just one book of the Bible. But when Bible scholars recreate the number of years that were spent in the cycle of sin, punishment, repentance, forgiveness, they calculate that the ratio of peace to captivity was as high as 5 to 1. For every one year of captivity, they had five years of peace and prosperity. If God were practicing tough love as described by psychologists today, he wasn't doing a very good job of it. One definition of tough love goes like this. Tough love is an expression used when someone treats another person, person harshly or sternly with the intent to help them in the long run. We think, of the term tough, we think the term tough love was created by the strict and conservative Bill Milliken. But even Milliken strongly emphasizes that a relationship of care and love is a prerequisite to tough love. Milliken also says that tough love requires that the caregivers communicate clearly their love to the recipient. So it sounds to me that, that before we go waving the banner of tough love, we need to be sure we first have the love part down really, really well. God practices love. He loved us first. He loves us no matter what. God bids us to show the same kind of sloppy agape to others. Here's an example. Luke 6, 27 through 28 says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Romans 12, 20 tells us, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And finally, Proverbs 25, 21 admonish us, admonishes us, If your enemy is hungry, give him food. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. You heard me correctly. Even in the Old Testament, often held up as the epitome of tough love, God tells us to show love to our enemies while they are still our enemies. How could we possibly think God would want less from us in how we treat our non-enemies, our neighbors, family, fellow believers, and friends? If you think someone in the ecclesia hates you or is your enemy, then show them love by providing for their needs. If you think a neighbor or coworker or family member hates you, then show them love by providing for their needs. And let me go all Mr. Rogers on you by stating emphatically that God loves you. Yes, you on the other side of the camera, just the way you are. 
You don't have to do anything for God to love you. He already loves you. Loving us is just, just the way we are does not mean he's okay with us making stupid choices. No, God expects us to change. But I want you to know that if you break your legs because you try to jump off a building like Superman, God will still love you in the midst of your stupid decision. He would like you to not break your legs by jumping off buildings, but he will still love you even if you do it. Now, for those of you out there who are not familiar with our belief system, this may be a bit of a shocker to you. There is no ever-burning eternal hellfire or place of torment waiting for even the worst of sinners. That's right. God loves mankind too much to sentence even the worst of us to be tortured forever. A God capable of that type of punishment would not be a God of love. And our God is a God of love who does no such thing. So let me repeat that just in case you're thinking, did she really say that? There is no ever burning, eternal, hellfire, or place of torment waiting for even the worst of sinners. Nope, not happening because God loves us all. Full stop, no ifs, ands, or buts, God loves us. Call it sloppy agape if you like. I welcome your thoughts, comments, and questions, and you can write me at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org. Very good. Thank you, sweetie. Wonderful job. I'm so proud of her. Okay, uh, while Nancy's going to get Bill, um, let me mention something about Bill's website, Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. It's, it's not a website, I'm sorry. It is his Facebook group. It just passed a milestone. It is now up to uh, 19,000 followers. 19,000. So if, uh, if you're not on following Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers, please get ready to go do that. Don't do it right now. Don't stop watching the show. But uh, go ahead and get uh, involved in that because you're going to be missing out on a lot of good stuff. At Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers, it's a uh, Facebook group. Now, before Bill gets on, let me remind you of one other thing. Um, we never ask you for money. We don't want your money. People give us money. We give it right back. Don't send us money. We don't want your money. But we do want stuff from you. Number one, we want your prayers. We want you to pray about the program because there are people out there that hate our program and they watch us, and we want them to pray about us too. And we also want to ask that you please hit the share button, because in that way we don't have to pay for any advertising or anything like that. You can help us out without spending a penny. If you find value in this show, please hit the share button. <coughs> Bill, the rumor tells me that you are now on the show. Are you there? I'm here, Wes. Good to be with you. Oops, I'm not getting in here. Okay, let me have your phone, sweetheart. Mine's not working. I got to be able to hold on, Bill. Be with you in just a second. Ah, are you there, Bill? Here I am. Good to be okay. with. Good to be with you, Wes. Yes, thank you for being here, uh, Bill. We're so glad to have you on the show, as always, because you always give us good stuff. Well, indeed, I thank you for that uh, uh, compliment and all that. And again, my pleasure to be with both of you. And, and, and thank you all again, audience. Terry, if you're listening. We, we appreciate everything you do, Terry. <laughs> she was a little embarrassed to put her picture up, but she looked good. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Do you notice those big blue eyes? See, he's got wonderful blue eyes, that's for sure. <laughs> what do you got for us tonight, Bill? Well, listen, uh, let me just say this. Good morning, Vietnam! Because you know what? It is actually Sabbath over in Vietnam uh, right now as we speak. Because, uh, you know, the Sabbath, 24 hours long, International Dateline and all that. So there's folks that watch us in, in uh, the Philippines and uh, India and the like, it's it's tomorrow, it's daytime. So anyway, glad to be with all of you here in our Star of Sabbath audience. Well, this evening, my topic is going to be Occupy Till I Come. And I'm going to be speaking about uh, the person who's pictured there on the screen, you see on the split screen there, that was Second Lieutenant Hiru Onoda. And he had never thought of himself as anything special. This is back in World War II era. My dad served in the Navy in World War II in the Japanese theater, seeing uh, a lot of action. He made me watch all the old uh, Victory at Sea. So I have a great interest in World War II history. And we're going to speak about this special soldier for the Japanese Imperial Army, Haru Onada. And when he was conscript conscripted into the Japanese Army in 1942, he expected only to do his duty. That was to fight. 
and if necessary, uh, to die for the emperor, emperor and for his country. Now, he never achieved a high rank. He never stood at the forefront of a, mar a mighty army. Yet this ordinary Japanese soldier story is one of almost incredible courage, endurance, loyalty, some important things that are lessons for us today. In the latter stages of World War II, Lieutenant Renata, he was stationed in the Philippines. And in order to stem the Allied advance, the retreating, retreating Japanese left behind guerrilla troops with orders to do everything possible to hold the territory and frustrate the enemy. Haru Onada was assigned to lead the guerrilla operations on the bank, which is a small island off of the coast of Mindanao in the Philippines. He wrote a book called No Surrender. After the war, Lieutenant Onada tells of the moment he received his orders. Quote, then with his eyes directly on me, my superior officer said, you're absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. Japanese soldiers in World War II would rather commit suicide rather than suffer the ignominy of being taken prisoner. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we're going to come back for you. And until then, as long as you have one soldier, you are, con you are to continue to lead him. You may have to live on coconuts, and if that's the case, live on coconuts. But under no circumstances are you to give up your life voluntarily. I said to myself, I'll do it. And even if I don't have coconuts, even if I have to eat grass and weeds, I'll do it. Those are my orders, and I will carry, carry them out, said Onada. <laughs> Onada and the men underneath his command took up their positions on the Bay Island in late 1944. Within the next several months, Japan was beaten, and Japanese forces everywhere were ordered to lay down their arms. Surrender orders were dropped by plane and leaflets uh, and the like and broadcast even over loudspeakers. And to Lieutenant Onada and his small force, he actually received those, seen some of the flyers that were dropped by planes. But he and his four companions refused. He had taken his orders at face value. He would not, under any circumstances, surrender. After all, he reason had not his country sworn to fight until the end, until not a single Japanese was left alive. And so Japan couldn't possibly have surrendered. It is an enemy trick. So Lieutenant Onada fought on. One by one, his companions deserted, or they were killed, or they were captured. And by the, uh, when, they, when the uh, armies had been uh, mobilized and the world picked up the pieces, Lieutenant Onada fought on. The 1940s became the 1950s, and the 1950s became the 1960s. And a new generation was growing up in Japan for whom the war was a memory. Japanese uh, people, they rose from defeat and became a prosperous industrial giant. Cameras, transistor radios replaced the invading forces from all over Southeast Asia. Fashions came and went. Man landed on the moon. But on Lubang Island, the real Onada fought on. Of course, there were times he became discouraged. His uniform had rotted away. He was often hungry and cold and lonely. There are many things he couldn't understand. Why were the battleships in the bay replaced by cruise ships? Where were the military aircraft? Why did the newspapers that he would find now and then, from time to time, give no news of the war? And why were there no more orders, no more instructions? But he never lost faith. His country had, formed, had sworn to fight to the bitter end, and his country still existed. For according to the newspapers, it was growing in prosperity. So they couldn't have lost the war. And that meant they would have to come back for him. His commanding officer had promised that. So Lieutenant Onada saw his job as clear cut and continued to perform it. Eventually, however, Lieutenant Onada did surrender. A young Japanese photographer who had made a quest to look for him, made contact with him and asked him under what circumstances he would give in. Lieutenant Onada's answer was simple. You have to send the man who told me not to give in. Only he can rescind the order. Back in Japan, Lieutenant Onada's commanding officer was located. He was now a middle-aged book dealer. He was issuing uh, copies of the original sur surrender orders and he had, uh, got so that he could go to the bank where eventually he was able to contact Lieutenant Onada. 
And so on March 9th, think of this now, 1974, 29 years after his country had surrendered, Kuru Onada emerged from the jungle. And in spite of his tattered uniform, he looked every inch a soldier. His weapons were in top-notch condition, clean and ready to go. He was still a fighting force. He was in good shape. And as the last warrior of the Second World War surrendered, he at least had a satisfaction of knowing that he had fulfilled his calling. He occupied till they came. Now, you're probably ahead of me when you're thinking of the lessons of the story for those of us that are called of God today. We didn't volunteer to be Christian soldiers. We were conscripted just like he was, called into the work of God. Christ set us in the body, not perhaps doing what we want to do, but as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, to what place us in the body as it pleases him. At present, this earth, the territory of the coming kingdom of God, is occupied by a hostile and alien power. Satan is the god of this world. But Christ said he would not take us out of the world, but leave us in it to do the work. He told us in Luke 19, verse 13, said, occupy till I come. Like Huru Anada, we are told our life is not our own. We are never to consider surrendering. We are never to consider quitting. We are to live in the enemy's territory and bear witness to another way of life. We've got to tell the good news that deliverance is coming to this unhappy and wretched world. Christ warned that since we would be in enemy territory, the mission would sometimes be hazardous. Then the enemy could attack, persecute us, do their best to persuade us to surrender him. He would try to discourage us and make us feel abandoned. He would try to discredit all of us. And we may personally witness thousands of others who have given up the fight. I know I have. Those that have quit, those that have even quit believing in God in any way, shape, or form. Those that have quit on believing the simple truths of the Bible like the Sabbath. And they will not carry on. I've seen it happen. It's given me great pain through the decades. He would try to make us feel that our fight is futile and the weapons inadequate. The sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness. Ah, oh, come on, this is the 21st century, right? Nobody fights with that stuff anymore. But our orders are clear. No matter how long it is, we must occupy till Christ comes back. He promised he will come back. And when he does, it says in Matthew 24, 46, he expects to find us, quote, so doing in fulfilling our orders. So brethren, fight on. Fight on. Don't let enemy propaganda wear you down. Stay loyal to our king. Do the work of a soldier of Jesus Christ, for this is our reasonable service. Now, Mr. Onada, Lieutenant Onada, as an ordinary soldier fighting for a physical emperor, showed that he understood this. He endured to the end. But how much more should we, fighting for the kings of kings and the Lord of lords, carry on and fight on? Brethren, always endure to the end. Very good. Thank you so much, Bill. We appreciate it. All righty, Wes. Thank you very much. And, and again, thank you to our audience. And I hope you got a good Sabbath plan for tomorrow. I hope you have a good one. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care now. God bless. All right. See ya. As we were saying before, um, we asked you to hit the share button. So if you haven't hit the share button, please do so now. Now, again, we have people that contact us and say we want to send you money. We say don't send us money. But... If you really want to send uh, money to a worthy cause, uh, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again, there is a really nice uh, little group of believers here in Tyler, Texas, Church God Seventh Day, got the address on the screen. <clears throat> if you'd like to send them a little donation, feel free to. Nancy and I don't get a cut for this, we don't get a finder's fee. Their address is 12513 Chapman Road, Tyler, Texas. Real nice group of people, really loving, really sweet people, they help the poor. They feed the flock. They preach the gospel. So if you have a need to send some money to somebody, uh, here's a little group that you can help out. All right. Coming up next, uh, we're going to talk about tattoos and the 613 laws of the Torah. But first, we're going to take a short commercial break. Which is worse, to declare something to be a sin when it's not? 
or to declare something to not be a sin when it is. One of the hardest things for a new Christian to understand is the fact that God does have standards. As a lifelong Christian, you may feel this sounds strange because some Christians believed in once saved, always saved. They say, I'm saved no matter what, so don't try to burden me with standards. Back in 1988, Ronald L. Dart gave a message entitled, God's Standards, where he showed how you can determine what God's standards are. You can find this message and many more on the website of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. Our website is rldea.com. Our website has many informative and interesting messages by the late Ron Dart, who was one of the most effective evangelists of the 20th century. Again, the title is God's Standards at rldea.com. We want to thank two people for that uh, commercial and all the commercials we have on the show. We have uh, Gary Gibbons, that's his beautiful golden voice that you sing on there, or here on there, and also uh, Carl Noctree, who puts the graphics on there. So thank you to those two guys. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I want to talk to young people right now, you know, teens and young adults. We're in our third segment now. I know that a lot of you might be somewhat confused about your mom and dad's religion. In some ways, it's kind of distant to you. It's not like you have bad feelings about your parents' religion. It's just that you don't quite get it when they start talking about some of the beliefs that they hold. And let's step back. Chances are that you, as a young person, believe in God. Chances are that you believe that the Bible is God's word. And chances are that you believe that Jesus died for your sins. But then after that, it starts getting a little bit fuzzy for you because you're not sure that you agree with mom and dad regarding things like tattoos. You're fully aware that mom and dad don't like tattoos, and you've heard them quote from Leviticus 19.28 where it says, Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. But here's the problem that invariably comes in with young people. Young people have said to me, I absolutely see that Leviticus 19.28 says not to have tattoos, but just because something in the Bible, does that mean we have to follow it? And here's their line of reasoning. They say, doesn't the Bible also say in Exodus 21.7 that we are actually allowed to sell our daughters into slavery? And you can just hear some smart alecky teenage boy saying, well, now that my sister's 15 years old, I wonder what mom and dad might do. Maybe they'll consider selling my little sister. And if they do, I wonder how much they could get for it. Or a young lady might be thinking about Leviticus 15, starting in verse 19, where it says that no man should have any contact with a woman who is in her monthly cycle. And this young lady's thinking, well, if people aren't supposed to be around me during this time, how should I let them know that I'm in my cycle? Should I tell them quietly, or should I carry a sign around my neck? And don't laugh this off, because the Orthodox Jews interpret this scripture very literally and the women make it known very clearly when they are in the cycle. They practice this very, very carefully, this scripture. Then young people come across Leviticus 2020, which says that a person should not approach the altar of God if he has a defect in his sight. So some kids are probably thinking, wait a minute, my dad wears glasses. Shouldn't his vision have to be exactly 2020 in order for him to approach God? Or, or does dad get a little bit of wiggle room on this one? Now, if you're a young person and you're asking these questions, you shouldn't feel guilty about it. And my guess is that you might just be afraid to bring up questions like this to your minister or even to your parents because you're afraid they'll laugh at you. Or maybe you're afraid they'll get angry with you. But I'm telling you this. These are valid questions. And anyone in the church who hears questions like this has no business laughing at these questions or getting mad about questions like this. Instead, Christians should be willing to look into these things so that they can answer these questions. Because if you're going to quote Leviticus 19.28, where you tell your kid not to get a tattoo, then you've got to have some reason why you're not also following the scripture about slavery, monthly cycles, and imperfect vision, and a whole bunch of other ones out there. I'm telling you, it's fair game to discuss these things because if we only deal with scriptures that we like 
and ignore the scriptures that we don't like, then what is that? Well, it's practicing a double standard. And we know that Jesus got angry with those religious leaders who practiced double standards during his lifetime. He called them hypocrites. So, let's see if we can better understand these scriptures. Let's see why it is that Christians follow some Old Testament verses while ignoring other Old Testament verses. And let's begin by understanding that our disagreements in these matters, most of the time, revolve around the laws that are in this thing called the Torah. Now, what in the world is the Torah? Let's back up. Remember that the Bible consists of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, you're with me so far? And the Old Testament consists of three parts. There's the Torah, there's the writings, and there's the prophets. The third group, the prophets, that's the easy one to understand because these are the books that were written by prophets, books such as 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Habakkuk, Malachi, all these books about prophecy. The writings, which is the second group, consists of the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and believe it or not, the book of Daniel is in that group. Another subject, another time. So that leaves us with the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These first five books of the Bible are called the Torah. The Torah sometimes can mean the teaching or it can mean the law. And it's in the Torah where we find most of these laws that Christians argue about where they say, we should keep this law and this law and this law, but we shouldn't keep that law and that law and that law. Again, most of these debatable laws are found in the Torah. Question, how many laws are there in the Torah? Well, the scholars have gone into the Bible, done a lot of work on this, and they've counted up all the laws that are in the Torah. They've come up with 613. And um, I, believe it or not, I found on the Internet this really cool spreadsheet that has each one of the 613 laws listed and I might make that available to you um, uh, next week when we talk about this a little bit more. It's all in an Excel spreadsheet. They can be sorted, and it's really cool for research. So we started this segment of the show talking about the law, talking about the Torah, and tattoos. And then we looked into the laws about slavery, monthly cycles, vision problems. And these things that we talked about are just some of the 613 laws in the Torah. Again... Our task tonight, as we pointed out earlier, is to understand why it is that we keep some of the 613 laws of the Torah while we ignore other of the 613 laws of the Torah. Now, here are a couple of questions that might blow your mind just a little bit. In this, in this day, in this time period, in this age, who is it that keeps all of the 613 laws that are in the Torah? Which group of people? Is it a nation? Is it a church? Is it a race? What people keep all 613 laws of the Torah? And I know that some of the young people out there, if I ask them that, they're going to say, well, my parents say that we in the church keep all 613 laws of the Torah. Now, the parents who say this might genuinely believe that we do, but guess what? The church does not keep all 613 laws of the Torah. We just simply don't. In fact, no one does. There is not a single person on the face of the earth who keeps all 613 laws of the Torah. And why not? Because it's impossible to keep all 613 laws at this time. Notice I said at this time. We'll explain that a little bit later. All right, let's go to our second question. In this day and age, who rejects all of the 613 laws of the Torah? All of them. What group? What people? The answer is no one. And someone says, well, I'll bet atheists and agnostics reject every one of the 613 laws of the Torah because they hate the Bible, so they reject all 613 of the Torah laws. Well, that's not true. And I can say this because every sane person on the face of the earth, whether he realizes it or not or wants to or not, he follows at least some of the laws in the Torah. Everybody who lives and breathes agrees with at least some of the Torah. Let me give you an example. There was a lady who lived years ago. Her name was Madeline Murray O'Hare. She was a devout atheist. She absolutely hated the idea of believing in the existence of God. 
she was the founder of the modern atheistic movement in America. Now, I never met the woman, but I've read from many sources that this lady was really crude and really foul-mouthed. And now, are, are all atheists this way? No, no, no. Over the years, I've met atheists and agnostics who are very, very nice people. Spent about an hour on the phone today with an atheist, one of the nicest guys I know. Back to Madeline Murray O'Hare. Madeline Murray was not nice, and she admitted it. She made no secret that she saw no need to be nice. She was vulgar, she was profane, she swore like a sailor, and even though she rejected the very idea of the existence of God, Madeline Murray O'Hare believed it was wrong to steal, and she believed it was wrong to murder. So in this regard, on these two points alone, Madeline Murray O'Hare was actually in agreement with the Torah, which very clearly says don't steal and don't murder. Again, no one rejects the precepts of the Torah completely. Everyone on the face of the earth believes in some part of the Torah, whether that person's a Catholic, Protestant, atheist, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever. Some Christians try to claim that they don't believe in the Torah, or for that matter, the entire Old Testament. These Christians say, our church only believes in the New Testament. They say, we believe that the Old Testament was done away with totally and completely at Calvary. There's one major denomination that will not allow musical instruments in their worship services. And I'm not talking about the evil instruments, you know, like I play, like drums and electric guitars. I'm talking about the quote-unquote good and holy instruments like piano and violin. I'm being sarcastic. This denomination rejects all instruments, even the good ones like piano and violin. And if someone points out to these people that there were all kinds of instruments in the tabernacle and temporal, temple, people from this denomination will reply, they'll say, that's the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is only good for history. And we only go by the teachings of the New Testament. And they say, in the New Testament, there's absolutely no approval given for musical instruments in the church. So they say, they're not only rejecting all 613 laws of the Torah, they're rejecting the entirety of the Old Testament. That's an interesting approach. And, and they say they're not bound by the teachings of the Old Testament, including the Torah. They say that you only go by what's in the New Testament, but when you press them for specifics, they have a real problem. You ask them, well, does this mean that we don't have to keep the commandment in the Torah regarding the Sabbath? And they emphatically say, yeah, the Sabbath command that we find in the Torah has been done away with. So then you ask them, what about the commandment in the Torah that forbids the making of graven images of God? Now these folks aren't quite so emphatic about this one because while they usually don't care for statues of Jesus, they don't mind pictures of Jesus. And, and, and they, they don't mind that. They might even have pictures of Jesus in their church building, but they sure don't want any statues of Jesus. And this is an interesting distinction. I don't understand it, but whatever. So you ask them, all right, how about the, commandment in, the commandments in the Torah about not committing adultery or bearing false witness? Shouldn't we obey these two commandments in the Torah? And at that point, they become a little bit fuddled. They meander around. They say things like, well, if you're converted, you just don't want to commit adultery. You just don't want to bear false witness. They say that somehow the Holy Spirit guides you into refraining from adultery and false witness, but then they make it very clear that the Holy Spirit doesn't guide you into doing something like keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. Again, this is another example of how people pick and choose what laws they want to keep in the Torah. Now, the bottom line is this, and this is a really important point, So, and bear with me. You, you may not like it, but it's true. Bear with me. The problem that Christianity has with the Torah is that everyone picks and chooses what they want to believe from the Torah. Can I repeat that? Everyone in Christianity picks and chooses what they want to believe from the Torah. There are no exceptions to this rule. Now, now stay with me. Don't, don't hit the shutoff button. Let, let me see if the numbers just drop dramatically. No, you're still holding in there. But hear me out, please. In our Sabbath-keeping movement, there are some who say we don't pick and choose. Yes, we do. And we need to be honest and admit that we all pick and choose. And I'm telling you that in this age, we have no choice. We are forced to pick and choose. We have no other option because we can't keep all 
all 613 laws of the Torah. It can't be done at this time. And we can't reject all 613 laws. So we've got to pick and choose. And that's not a bad thing. And we're going to get into that. The problem we're dealing with in this business of the Torah is that we have trouble agreeing with each other on what to pick, what to choose. That's where the dispute is. Now, in the Torah, there are commands to build mikvahs, M-I-K-V-A-H, or how to sew blue fringe into the edge of your garments, or to observe new moons and high days. And let me tell you what those scriptures are so you can write them down, read them later. We don't have time to read them. Regarding the, the command regarding mikvahs, one of the 613 laws, is Leviticus 11.36. Write that down, Leviticus 11.36. Then there's the command regarding sewing blue fringe into your garments. That's found in Numbers 15.37. Numbers 15.37. And then there's the command regarding the new moons. It's found in 1 Chronicles 23.30. 1 Chronicles 23.30. And what we're going to come, we're going to circle back to a lot of this stuff. Now, while we're on the topic of picking and choosing, let's be real frank. Because there are too many in Christianity who love to condemn sin while they ignore the commands to help the poor. And can we talk about this frankly tonight? Can, can, I, can I really, you know, be honest with you? Yes, it is our job as Christians to condemn sin. But we've also got to remember it's our job as Christians to help the poor. And we say this because, yes, there are many scriptures that condemn sin, but, yes, there are many scriptures that command us to help the poor. So in the church, we are charged with doing both. Can we agree on that? But take a moment right now, and don't say it out loud. Don't answer me in the chat room. I don't, I don't want anybody to think that we're picking on any particular church. But take a moment and think about the messages that you hear in your church. Are you hearing a lot more messages about condemning sin than messages about helping the poor? What's going on in your church? Because... I'm telling you that too many Christians place a whole lot of emphasis on condemning sin while they pretty much ignore the commands to help the poor. And again, there are plenty of scriptures telling us to do both. We shouldn't focus only on condemning sin. We've got to put just as much emphasis on helping the poor and doing other good works. Every Christian needs to ask this question as we go through this study. And we're going, to, we're going to get kind of exhaustive in this. As I pick and choose what scriptures I want to obey and don't obey in the Bible, do I place more emphasis on condemning sins of other people than I do on performing good works, such as feeding the poor, visiting the sick, helping the fatherless? I want to show you my age now. I remember a stupid TV show that was on years ago called Bewitched. I couldn't stand that program, but my sister liked it. And we only had one TV back in those days, so I ended up watching a lot of episodes of Bewitched that I wished I hadn't. And one of the more annoying parts of the show was this character called Mrs. Kravitz. She lived next door to Samantha and Darren. Mrs. Kravitz was the ultimate busybody. She had these pink curlers in her hair, and she wore a powder blue bathrobe. And she sat all day, glued to the window, watching her neighbors and trying to find fault with them. We don't want to be a church of Mrs. Kravitz's. We don't want to spend our time looking out the window of the world, condemning people instead of doing what we need to do in our Christian walk. When I was a kid, I'd look at Mrs. Kravitz on TV and yell, mind your own business. And if I watched her today, which I, I won't do because we got more than one TV and if Nancy wants to watch it, she can't, I'm not going to watch it. But if Nancy says, I'm not going to watch that. Okay, yeah. But if I were to watch it, I'd yell at the screen, I'd say, go help out in the soup kitchen. All right, again, each of us needs to ask the question, as I pick and choose what to obey and don't obey in the Torah, do I place more emphasis on condemning the sins of other people than I do on performing good works such as feeding the poor, visiting the sick, helping the father? In other words, do I need to change? Because until Jesus returns, question about, questions about change should be asked daily by every Christian. We've got to overcome sin. We've got to do a better job at hitting the mark. And as I always tell you, 
I can't answer that question for you about how much you need to change. I got enough to do to worry about me. And why can't I answer it for you? Well, because I got enough to do to worry about me, but also because you got to work out your own salvation through fear and trembling. All right, picking and choosing. Let's look at a couple of my favorite dichotomies. And here are two diametrically opposite extremes when it comes to picking and choosing from the Torah. The first guy I knew years ago who was really, really into the Old Testament, Sabbath keeper, just like you and me, brother in Christ. This guy lives and breathes the Old Testament. He knows the Hebrew language. He's very familiar with all 613 laws of the Torah. And I doubt you've ever seen a guy try to keep as many of the Old Testament laws of the Torah as he could. He really wanted to keep as many as he could, except one. There's one Old Testament law that he hates. He is totally and completely against tithing. He doesn't want to have to send any of his money to any ministry or church group, so he embraces so much of the Old Testament, but he especially rejects that one law, tithing. And again, we teach tithing on this show. We do not teach second and third tithing. We teach just tithing. Someone says, oh, you teach first tithing. No, there's no such thing as a first tithe. There's just a tithe. And we've got a show on that. We teach tithing, but we don't accept tithes. Don't want your tithes. That's one guy. Then we have a completely opposite guy. There was this guy who used to preach on TV. His name was Gene Scott. And I know some of you used to watch him. He was a hoot. He's dead now. And I used to enjoy watching him on TV just for fun. It was better than watching the news. He was this long-haired preacher, had long blonde hair, and he always wore a hat, and he smoked a cigar. And Scott's thing was grace, grace, grace. That's all he wanted to teach was grace. He wouldn't teach against homosexuality, against fornication. He wouldn't teach the Ten Commandments. He only wanted to talk about grace. To him, the Old Testament was a great historical document, but he said, you don't want to go to the Old Testament for doctrine. He said, if you want doctrine, you go to the Gospels or the writings of Paul. That's all. Because he hated the book of James. Well, why did he hate James? Well, because James wrote, faith without works is dead. Scott hated reading anything about our being required to do good works. So this preacher, Gene Scott, rejected the teachings of the Old Testament. A whole, a whole bunch of them. Well, except one. And guess which teaching from the Torah that he really, really liked? You got it. Tithing. I mean, did Scott teach tithing or what? He'd tell his listeners, he'd say, you better tithe to me because I'm your preacher, and if you don't tithe to me, you're a blankety blank blank blank, and he'd go on to call his non-tithing audience a whole bunch of nasty names. Again, Scott was the total antithesis of this other guy who hated tithing but loved the Torah. The Torah. So you're talking about picking and choosing. In the religious world, it's all over the place. Let's cut to the chase now. Why do we believe what we believe? And I'm going to give you some principles that I follow on picking and choosing. And I believe that a lot of you out there follow these principles. And you may not have heard them articulated this way before, but I think that most of you that are Sabbath keepers are going to agree with these. Again, I do not follow all 613 laws of the Torah. I only follow certain ones. And here's why I follow the ones I do. i got several principles here. The first one. In the Torah, we find instructions for how to conduct oneself inside the temple and the tabernacle. Here's an example. Again, uh, this is one of the commands that are part of the 613 laws of the Torah. Leviticus 16.4. Speaking of the high priest, it says, He shall put on a holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches on his flesh. He shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen turban shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his flesh in the water and so put them on. And actually, there are more commands similar to this about how you conduct yourself going into the holy place, who can go into the holy of holies, how the priests were to dress, what basins to use, what water to pour, what colors to paint the walls, on and on and on it goes. And this is the, the one I just read. That's just one example of the laws that we're talking about now. And here's our first principle. We simply can't obey the laws about the temple and the tabernacle because the temple and the tabernacle no longer exist. So these laws can no longer be obeyed. Let me repeat that principle. 
We simply can't obey the laws about the temple and tabernacle because the temple and tabernacle no longer exist. It's that simple. And some people are going to say, oh, well, that, that does away with a whole bunch of laws. No, no, no. If you say that and agree with it, be careful. Don't start lumping other stuff into the temple tabernacle thing because we've got other laws that are not part of the temple thing. But people say, since the temple's been destroyed, the Sabbath's done away with and all these other things. Be careful to not apply that where it doesn't belong. These tabernacle temple laws fall under the category of, and the scholars call it the temple, the sanctuary, and sacred objects. And if um, I end up sending out this uh, Excel spreadsheet, you know, maybe I can get Carl to post it on the DCM website. That might be easier. And I want to mail it out. And by my count, there are like 32 of these laws in the Torah that apply specifically to the temple. And since the temple no longer exists, we no longer keep these laws. Once we understand that principle, it removes a big pile of Torah laws that we don't keep simply because we can't keep them. And it's not like you have the option to ignore these laws or we say, well, you can ignore them if you like. No, you, you have no choice. You can't keep these laws, period, case closed. So this is our first group that, that, that of, of laws. Now, some of you are going to disagree and you're going to say, well, someday a temple is going to be rebuilt and that uh, we're going to be uh, obeying these temple commands. Now, we're not going to get into a discussion tonight on whether or not a temple is going to be built in Jerusalem. Personally, now don't get mad at me, but personally, I think it's going to be built. That's what I see in prophecy. And I know some of you don't agree with me, and that's fine. As always, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But our topic tonight is not whether the temple is going to be rebuilt. We could go off on that. The point is this. When this happens, we'll deal with it. When, when the Jews find out who the Levites are, and they do the ashes of the red heifer, and, you know, they kick uh, the, the uh, Muslims off the Temple Mount, when all that happens and they build the temple, we'll deal with it then. Until it happens, we don't need to argue about what we're going to do or not do inside the temple. In other words, usually it's a waste of time debating hypotheticals. All right, here's what's important. Right now, at this time, in this age, in this current dispensation, there is no temple or no tabernacle for that reason. Whether you want to or not, you simply cannot obey any of the 613 laws on how to conduct yourself in the temple or tabernacle. Again, any of the 1613 laws of the Torah that relate to the tabernacle temple are to be disregarded. Is that one of the, am I oversimplifying? I think that's an easy one. That's a no-brainer, isn't it? All right. Wish we had a studio audience so, so you could say, no, it's not easy, and, you know. All right, let's look at our second principle. We're running out of time. All right, now get this, number two. Many people say that a lot of the laws in the Torah were only for ancient Israel. They say we don't have to keep a lot of the Torah laws today because they were just for the ancient Israelites. And I believe this is true. Again, our disagreement comes when determining which ones we're supposed to keep and which ones we're supposed to ignore because just about all Christians believe we've got to keep some of these Torah laws. Okay, which ones? All right, well, this is our second principle. I figure that if a teaching in the Torah is also taught by the apostles after the crucifixion, I'm going to follow it. Can I say that again? So make sure it sinks in. If a teaching in the Torah is also taught by the apostles after the crucifixion, I'm going to follow it. Now, if you disagree with that principle, I want you to please let me know. Help me out here. And please don't just tell me, oh, I disagree. Please show me why you disagree with it. Tell me why my reasoning is bogus. Because, you know, I'm learning just like you are. I'm not the repository of all knowledge. I'm not a theologian. Uh, I'm not a historian. I'm not a linguist. I'm just a guy just like you, okay? Just, just, uh, just a, 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 a Christian, a follower of Christ. I mean, God gave us not only his Bible, he also gave us reasoning power, which we're supposed to exercise under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So I admit I'm not perfect in my reasoning always. Sometimes I mess it up. So if my reasoning is wrong tonight, tell me. And here's an example of this principle. And here's why I believe this principle. This is an example. Exodus 20.12 tells us to honor our father and mother. Was that command only for the ancient Israelites. And I know some of you out there right now are saying, well, if it's in the Ten Commandments, yeah, 
It's, it's only for the ancient Israelites. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and mother was it only for the ancient Israelites. Let's turn, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may, well, may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. So here is a command. It's in the Torah, and then it's repeated by the Apostle Paul after the crucifixion. So my question is, am I totally out of line to say, since this command is in the Torah, and then is repeated in the New Testament, that we should keep it? Again, I believe this command about honoring parents from the Torah is one that we in the church are to keep today. And why? Because I think it's a valid principle that if a teaching is in the Torah and then it's also taught by the apostles after the crucifixion, I'm going to follow it because how can you say that was nailed to the cross? It wasn't. Paul's teaching it long after Jesus died and was resurrected. Again, if you disagree with me on this, please tell me why you disagree because I want to hear from you on this. And if you uh, don't want to talk in the chat room, want to talk to me privately, my email address is wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. I'd love to hear from you. Even when you disagree with me, just please don't call me fat. That's all I ask. Don't call me fat. All right. Uh, we, we've we got to end now. Uh, Nancy, uh, let's, let's go into the chat room now, okay? Uh, I'm sure you've got some things in there where people are mad at me and people are never going to watch the show again. And um, I want to hear those disagreements. Uh, in the meantime, we got to come back to this next week, and we are going to be back next week. And uh, we're going, and then after next week, we're going to take off for two weeks because we're taking off to go to Branson for the feast. But um, we'll be back next week. We're going to finish this up because I've got some more principles. I've only given you two. I'm going to give you some more. And we got to circle back to the tattoo thing. Okay. So we still got a lot of work to do. So uh, don't leave now because now is the fun part where you get to uh, pick on Wes and call him names. Just don't call me fat. And, and, well, okay, so <laughs> no one called you fat. Uh, in the uh, chat room of YouTube, I wanted to point out that there was a gentleman, well, I assume he was called himself doctrinal enforcer. I don't know if that was a guy or a girl, but I'm going to use the he, uh, who took exception to, uh, I believe it was my segment about love because he was talking uh, we hit his comments because he, he, they were not nicely stated. Okay. But um, he did mention uh, places where in Old Testament they were to kill whole nations and things like yeah. that. So maybe you can take on that at some point and talk about that in detail. You can, we don't want to. I don't want to give any platitudes today or, or easy answers. These are things that people question about, especially someone uh, like doctrinal enforcer who um, who who seemed to be a, like upset about what God had done in the past and felt like he, he wasn't loving God. So okay. just something to think about. For okay. Later. All right. All right. So let's see. On your um, rock and roll segment. Oh, can I say something? Robert uh, Yobi says, question, does it really matter if a temple is built? And if so, what religion would run it? Oh, boy, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, would it be the Orthodox, the Conservatives? Will it be the Hasidic? Yeah, that's would, an excellent question. Who would do it? Okay. Okay, Peter came in and said, said got you beat, West, Buddy Holly, uh, <coughs> Churchberry, and Elvis. Okay. Uh, Daryl Ambrose said uh, that she'd seen it in her husband's band, these kind of uh, breakups. And Richard Maxwell said, well, life is controversial. So. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, anyway, okay, so in my segment, um, Bill uh, Lucenheid said, uh, "Given I uh, guess Mr. Rogers didn't like the Three Stooges. And uh, I saw Wes laughing when I was talking about that. He, Wes is a Stooges fan. Um, <laughs> I right. love the Stooges. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I let Nancy get on the show and extol the virtues of the teachings of, of Mr. Rogers, knowing that I don't agree with Mr. Rogers because I love the Stooges. And by the way, I think I prefer Shemp over Curly, and that's going to get me a lot of hate mail, but okay. 
What else you got, sweetheart? Uh, Paul Shaw wants to know if we're going to do SOS from the Feast of Tabernacles, and Wes answered that. That's right, we are not, because no. guess what? People are getting enriched in person at the feast, and there a lot of there are a lot of messages that are being uh, yeah. broadcast. So uh, th uh, I won't say you don't need us or don't want us, but uh, we feel like we can take a little break then. And, and let's face it, people are so busy. Uh, we did that one year at the feast, and hardly anybody watched. Everybody's busy at the feast. They don't, when you go to the feast somewhere, and you're fellowshipping with people you haven't seen in years and years, you don't want to sit there and stare at a TV screen and see Wes and Nancy. You can see us any Friday night. Once you're in feast mode, Wes and Nancy are so... Open a nice bottle of wine and talk to the people in front of you. Exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> I will mention that in the revised, the modern version, the movie of the Three Stooges, at the end of the movie, before the credits, yeah. the Stooges come out and show that their hammers were rubber, you know, and stuff like that, they, that they really weren't hurting anybody, so, but, um, uh, so Bill Brad said, uh, uh, thank God that there is not an eternal punishment. Yes. Um, There's eternal death. Yes. But there's not eternal torture, right? Which is what most most churches believe in eternal torture, right? That's wrong. And and when I was a teenager, that was the thing that turned me off to religion because mm -hmm. I was raised in a church that said if you reject God and disobey Him, you're going to burn in hell forever and ever and suffer and suffer and suffer. And I thought this is not a God of mercy, and that's true. Our God mercifully, and again, I don't think it's going to be a lot of people who are going to reject Him in the end. And when they do reject them, they've had their chance, it'll be instant death. There's none of this business with uh, demons with pitchforks and ever-burning hell. No, that's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, Peter came and quoted Jude 4 through 14, said God's punishment is intended to protect his people from those who would cause them to err and sin. And to that, I, and I was going to look up those scriptures, but, you know, when I leave my screen, sometimes I lose all the comments, so I didn't want to yeah. do that. Uh, but I would say that the purpose of the law is to protect us from people who would cause us to err in sin. Uh, once the punishment comes up, unless you mean like some people say like capital punishment keeps people from murdering because they know they could be, you know, uh, put to death. So unless you're saying it in that way. Yeah. Um, he also said that the uh, sloppy agape and ever burying hell, thanks be to God that there is neither. And I say, right, there, it's not really sloppy agape. I think that's what Peter's saying. It's, it's not really sloppy agape. It's God's love. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, people use that term, and I, I hope you got my point out there about that. Uh, Bill Segments, uh, Marion Young Perkins said, thanks, Bill. We must stay strong. Yeah, amen. And Richard Maxwell says, don't call good evil or evil good. And Willow Love Al reminds us of the song, Onward Christian Soldiers. It talks about us. Um, and Mar Toma Stanton says, I love you guys. Thank you. We love you too. <laughs> awesome. We do. We, we love, love you right that. back. Thank right you. Right back at you. Okay, so now I'm going to try and get through all the comments about uh, the 613 laws. Did anybody say anything about my boots? Uh, no. Oh, all right. No, uh, no. Amy Hohert says some uh, some also believe the scripture that uh, the woman on her cycle that the woman should um, uh, that's not the one I wanted to read sorry she said that uh, she knew a woman who took that one literally she would bring a chair pillow to sit at church so that whenever she was on her period she would not make the chair unclean oh my yeah. really I hadn't heard that's a new one on me I'm so sorry to hear that so so uh, she was letting the world know yeah oh my okay. Yeah. Um, Richard Maxwell says he has a t tattoo and a pierced ear, did it when he was young <laughs> and dumb and over a fool's hill, but I would not get one today, my own opinion. <laughs> but that's pretty open. Thank you for your honesty, Richard. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, Jeffrey Flum says the Torah was given for Israel under the Old Covenant. Xavier St. Hope. Uh, it says, priests that have blemishes must not minister in the sanctuary, and quotes a scripture that talks about that. Yeah, um, uh, in the same way that an animal couldn't have a blemish, mm -hmm. none of the priests could either. Mm -hmm. And there's this one, and I don't want to get too graphic, because I think we've been graphic enough tonight, that if there was an accident where a priest had his stones crushed, let's not talk about it, 
uh, it hurts just thinking about it, but um, he couldn't be a priest anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, you had to be in really, really good shape to be a priest. But thankfully, uh, God takes us all, warts and freckles and blemishes and scars yeah. and tattoos and piercings and all of those things still. But wants to know if you, these people don't even have kazoos in their... In their no, in their I don't think so. Houses. No, I don't think kazoos uh, so would be allowed in this... Uh, I don't, don't know about the, the don't I don't know about the people that you're talking about, but I once went to a wedding in a church where no instruments were allowed, and they had a a DVD of musical accompaniment that was all people doing it with their voices. Right. Mm -hmm. And that it was amazing. Yeah. That you could do that. But. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Flum also quotes Romans 12 or 2:14 mm -hmm. for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These not having the law are unto the law are, are a law unto themselves. Okay. <laughs> Kevin O'Hare says I didn't know Wes was going to talk about his family. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My sister said, "Oh, Wes is going to talk about our family." So a lot of families out there. <laughs> and Kevin lives in Hessville, Indiana, so I can't imagine what his family's all about. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Thanks, Bill, for all your encouragement for people to share. The little share button is below the comment, so please do share. I love Robert Giobi's comment. I think we should go over all 613 laws one by one. Uh, if we don't stop and we keep going, we can get it done by Tuesday. <laughs> can we? I'm going to be sleeping through some of that. <laughs> It'd be like going through some of the begats, you know, in the Old Testament. That's right. And Amy says she knows people who use blue fringe or tassels. Uh -huh. And, and mm -hmm. um, I've seen I've seen guys wearing those, you know, just they wear them with their garments. Don't make a big deal. Yeah, and Amy said she loved Bewitched. Oh, Amy. Oh. Richard points, uh, Maxwell points out that there are sins unto death and sins not unto death. Yep. And Diane Kitchen, Kitchen Taylor Webb uh, says, don't forget the widows and their afflictions. That's right. Absolutely. I didn't okay. say widows and orphans, I hope. I hope I said widows and orphans. Maybe uh, I, I don't know, but Maybe she I said didn't. it, so there you go. Yeah, and if I forgot it, I'm sorry. i got to remember that if I ever talk about this again, they'll always include the widows. Absolutely. That's right. Uh, Bob Petty says the Ten Commandments are the basis of most civil law. The other six, the 613 other commandments are judgments about situations or temple worship or certain types of idolatry, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Petty says the gospel message can be gleaned from many of the Old Testament writings. Amen. That's very right. good. Genesis, um, I've forgotten it already. Um, where, Let us make man in our image is part of the gospel. And the uh, Genesis 3.15, where God pronounces a sentence on um, the serpent, that's part of the gospel message. And that's just the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. The, the gospel message is all throughout the Old Testament. And I don't understand why anybody would want to throw out the Old Testament. I don't when I was a kid, they gave me this little Bible. It was only the New Testament and the Psalms. That's all that was in that Bible. I think they'd also put Proverbs in there. It, maybe they did, but I don't think they did. But, I mean, why would you print just the New Testament and, and leave out the Old Testament? There must be some economic reason for it or something. I don't know. No, but I think the they old, were saying this. You just worry about this. Yeah. Matthew, on your point a little the, bit. The, they just worry the about this. Yeah, the Old Testament is awesome. It's too wonderful. hard to understand. Um... <laughs> Sharon Lewis pointed out that someone loved every single comment, and Bill fessed up. It's him. He hit the love button on every single comment, so good for you, Bill. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Willow Love Al points out that there was a man who ran for president and was a Mormon, but he was a tither and uh, ran against Obama. So. Yeah, well, we're talking about, um, why can't I think Yeah, of I know. Name? I can't think of his name either right now. Um, it's like crazy. Yeah. Somebody tell us in the ch chat room. Yeah, he was a Mormon, and I'm telling you, the Baptists down here in Texas were really tearing into that guy and saying all kinds of things about him, that he wasn't a Christian, and just awful things. And, and I just, I feel, I, I mean, I didn't vote for the guy, Mitt Romney. Yeah. Um, I didn't vote for Romney. I, I didn't vote for Obama. But um, I, I just hate it when someone says, oh, you're a this in your religion, therefore you're not a Christian. Well, wait a minute, he professes Christ. He doesn't agree with you on a lot of doctrines, but that doesn't mean you can claim he's not a Christian. Only right. God only God can make that statement. So I think Romney got a bad deal from a lot of 
Christians down here in Texas. Right. Richard Maxwell points out that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I think that's a great thing to remember. We talk about the veil of the temple being rent, yeah. and people who are the priests going into the temple had to be blemish-free, but we are the temple of the Holy, Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be living more blemish-free lives yes. than that, but to do that, we have to have the sacrifice of Jesus. So we have to live like mm -hmm. the temple blemish-free, and when we mm -hmm. make those mistakes, get forgiveness, um, and, and go back to being a temple of the, that the Holy Spirit can dwell in. And, and along those lines, that's why a lot of people say the temple is not going to be built. They said the temple's here mm -hmm. in the form of every one of us who has the Holy Spirit. So I want to give equal time. I said I believe the temple is going to be built, but those who say it's not going to be built, that's why they say the temple's already here. So I, I want to be fair to everybody. Um, I do want to point out, we, we talked about the feast a little, but Monday is the Day of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets. Yep. And uh, we'll be up in Texarkana, right? So yes, I hope that you have a service that you can go to. I believe uh, CGI is broadcasting a couple of services from different places. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's other churches out there that are broadcasting. So if you can be somewhere in person and fellowship on this very important day when we picture Jesus Christ returning and starting the process of changing this world. Well, yeah. I guess we start the process. We're yeah. supposed to be starting the process now by our lives. But just yeah. physically get, comes back to the earth. We can't wait for that day. So it's a, it's a great time. Um, I, I still loved it with my kids. We'd always have a nice dinner on, the, on that night. And we blew a toy trumpet no shofar for me i just and no real trumpet it was just a little plastic trumpet that one of the kids had and, and bill probably it. blows the kazoo he probably does yeah that's true and we're going to hear john reedy give the sermon that day up in texas I, I believe that's true mm -hmm. um let's see willow love Al says you're a humble man west who really takes good care of his wife oh well i do love my wife some people say too much but that's all right Okay, so Nick White says the laws of clean and unclean meat are part of the Mosaic law, have nothing to do with the temple, and most Sabbath keepers follow these laws. But if you keep that part of the Mosaic law, why not also wear the tassels? Ah. And, and also command it there. That's also a command there. Excellent, excellent question. We're going to talk about clean and unclean uh, next time. On, on uh, That's one of our things coming up. Sorry okay. we ran out of time. Right. That's an excellent question. Come, come back next week and we'll talk about that, okay? Okay, so the last sentence is, there, I think there is a reason the Mosaic Law was written on parchment paper by man, but the Ten Commandments were written in stone by God. And I think that's a good analogy. Yeah, good you know? point. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Soko Fahi says, listening to you, West Sabbath services, and my trusted brethren help me to learn more, especially reading the Bible. I love asking friends questions. Thanks. Good. Well, ask us any questions you want. We may not have the answer, but we're not going to get mad at you. And again, we don't have all the answers, okay? Don't don't tune into this show and say, oh, those folks there got all the answers. And if Wes and Nancy don't know, surely Bill's going to know. No, we, we don't have all the answers. We're still learning. Right. Mark Silas says, uh, great logical thoughts about the Torah, Wes. Beth Lane Me says, your boots were made for walking. <laughs> well, not really. They do not look like comfortable boots. <laughs> Judith McCarthy says, trumpets is her favorite high day. Very good. Interesting. Uh, Richard Maxwell says, Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. I like this from Mary and Young Perkins. If the Old Testament is unimportant, then Jesus and the apostles would not have quoted scriptures from it. Amen. Yeah, what were they doing leaning on that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that e excellent point, Mary and Young Perkins. If, if it was no good, why did Jesus and the apostles, why did they like it so much? Yeah, and I uh, saw at one point somebody who uh, who talked, and it's you could probably Google it now, there was um, someone who said, like, how many of the scripture, how many Old Testament scriptures are quoted in the New Testament, or what portion of the New yeah. Testament is quoted from the Old Testament. Um, so, that would be interesting. If you know where that is, or you can lead me to it, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Mimi says she was baptized on trumpets in 2010. Oh, very great. good. So, it's a great day for us to, to uh, celebrate that, too. Yeah, uh, my first church service I ever attended was on Feast of Trumpets. And I remember David Antion spoke that day, gave an excellent sermon, and he talked about the three types of love, agape, phileo, and eros. Oh. I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. Wow. I don't know why, but uh, I wish my sermons could be that effective. 
that someone would say back in 1971, Wes White gave a sermon on trumpets, and this is what he said, but people don't remember. I've got that sermon about the flood that's on YouTube. That's the highest, oh. uh, gets the most hits at CGI. Is yeah. I bet people remember that one. I hope so, because yeah. <laughs> the graphics, Jeff put in good graphics, that's why. So Peter came and points out that the Old Testament was the early church's Bible, absolutely. Yep, absolutely, because they didn't have the uh, Bible in the, uh, or the, they didn't have the New Testament in the early days of the church, mm -hmm. and because it hadn't been written yet. That's right. And so they had, to, what was their Bible? It was the Old Testament, and it's like, uh, it, it, it they believed in the religion of the Old Testament. They followed it. They didn't follow the religion of the Jews of the time. They did not follow first century Judaism. They did not follow that. That's what Jesus fought with the uh, uh, Pharisees about and the scribes and the Sadducees. He fought with them over their additions to the Old Testament, their first century Judaism. That's what he, he never disagreed with what was in the Old Testament. Jesus never disagreed. All right. You know what? It's almost 9.30. Oh, yeah. We're, we're having a good time. We're having a ball here. We're looking forward to uh, fellowshipping with people in person tomorrow and uh, on again on uh, Monday. So we only have one day to get some stuff done between the two holy days. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thankful to have my second third day weekend, <laughs> three-day <laughs> weekend. <laughs> it was Labor Day last weekend. This weekend, uh, we have trumpets off, so looking forward to that. Yeah, and we're going to uh, Church God Seventh Day in Tyler tomorrow. Yeah, and um, four thirty. There's, there's, they uh, primarily they speak Spanish, mm -hmm. but when we go, they provide us with a translator, that's which true. is awfully nice that's of them. True. So, and uh, they're just really sweet people. So that's where we're going to be. Tomorrow. Lots of kids there too. Oh, tons of kids, and Nancy always shows up with a bag of cookies. Mm -hmm. And I learned to say "Tango Galletas," which means, which means "I have cookies." I have cookies. That's the, <laughs> that's the only thing Nancy can say in Spanish. That's not true. I have cookies, and the little kids just flock to yeah. her. I can also ask for the bathroom. That's oh yeah, Bonnie knows yeah, and all so. that stuff. Okay, uh, shall we close with prayer? We need to do that. Yes. Okay, our Father in heaven, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, experience for us. We thank you for the love. Uh, that we had shown on, on uh, among the uh, brethren tonight electronically. We thank you that you got us through the electronic difficulties. We thank you that you gave us an opportunity to study your word and that we could talk about it uh, in real time back and forth uh, between all of us. And this is a wonderful blessing that you've given us, this internet. We're sorry that the world uses the internet for so many bad things. Help us to use the internet for good things as we fellowship every Friday night on SOS. Now, Father, we ask that you put your blessing on everybody who's going to be traveling tomorrow, uh, going to church and uh, fellowshipping in real time and in, in real life, life uh, as opposed to electronically. Uh, we ask your blessing on those who can't make it to church because of illness or distance or whatever the reason is that they have. Please put your blessing on those folks as well as they're probably going to be tuning into some live church service. So again, we Thank you for this opportunity. Please be with us as we try to be obedient to you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that saves us. We give you praise and thanks and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath and Feast of Trumpets. Yes. Wow. Good night.